Welcome to the Building Centre. This is an exhibition about landscape, it's an exhibition about landscape architecture, and it's an exhibition that tackles some of the most important issues facing the way we build uh, the country that we live in. Rethinking the Urban Landscape is an attempt to look at the way in which public health, green infrastructure, the impact of the economy, and the changing demands of climate change change the landscape, specifically of the city. What we've tried to do is to illustrate some of the ways in which landscape architects are changing the way that we live in the city. We want to illustrate some of the ways in which important issues like public health, the management of water, the way we create new housing estates are all influenced by the way we invest in landscape. And what we've done is put together about 45 really interesting examples of contemporary landscape architecture, all of it in an urban context much of it in Britain, many of the projects from overseas. The exhibition looks at community. It looks at the important way in which the way in which you engage with a community has a huge impact on landscape. It looks at water and one of the most fascinating sections in the exhibition looks at sustainable drainage. The world of sustainable drainage is hugely affected by government regulation. The Flood and Water Management Act, which is implemented in April 2015, will make a huge difference to the way in which we build homes, and the exhibition illustrates some of the really creative ways in which sustainable drainage can be designed and can be implemented. The exhibition also looks at public health. Public health is absolutely an issue for landscape architects. In 2013, responsibility for public health moved in England from the National Health Service to local authorities so that public health directors are now working alongside planning officers and part of their obligation is to look at the way investing in landscape can create healthy places, can create safe routes to work, uh, can create areas which are not um, polluted. So there's a very interesting set of case studies in which we look at the impact of landscape architecture on improving public health. But one of the biggest themes in the um, exhibition has been influenced by the Olympics. In many ways, um, it was the Olympic Park, which opened in 2012, which changed the face of landscape architecture. The Architects Journal said in December 2012, landscape architecture has reinvented itself because of the Olympics. Um, the public became fascinated by the way um, the Olympic Park had been designed, by the use of wildflower meadows, and indeed by the way that the, the whole landscape of what had been one of the most derelict parts of London was totally transformed. And one of the more fascinating aspects of the design of the Olympic Park was the way in which water was managed, the way in which land was managed, and one of the greatest um, benefits of the new design for the Olympic Park was the fact that 5,000 homes were taken out of a flood risk zone. So there's a story about the Olympic Park and the way in which the Olympic Park designed has really set the scene for many of the other stories in this exhibition. The first part of the exhibition is called Start Here. Not only is it where we want everyone to start, but it's also got a very clear message that you need to start with the landscape. If you do not start with the landscape, you will make mistakes. And one of the clearest messages of the exhibition is that you need to respond to the landscape, to think about the character of the landscape, and think about the landscape before you think about buildings. And what we also want people to do is to think about the many different ways in which landscape could be used, because it's not just parks, it's not just boulevards, it's not just maybe children's playgrounds, but it's the interconnected landscape, the landscape of green infrastructure, which is so important. Because good, well-designed landscape will also be multifunctional. So a landscape which is the site of a football ground will also be a site of recreation for other groups of people, but most importantly, it may well be where you will store um, floodwaters. And one of the most cost-effective ways of using landscape is to make sure that it is connected and that it has many different purposes. And we've got a variety of case studies which are now exploring the way in which you build new parks. We've got a brilliant example uh, 
a very new park, only one year old in Birmingham, called Eastside Park. It's a brand new amenity. It's next door to the site of the new railway station for Crossrail, and it's really put a new part of Birmingham on the map. And then we've got a much, much smaller, smaller scheme, which is called the Hernhill High Line, and that is a proposal to take the roofs of all of the shops next door to the railway line by Hernhill Station in South London and to turn them into growing landscapes. Uh, a much smaller scale scheme, but in its local area, it could have just as much of an impact. And we complement that with a scheme called Triton Street, which is right at the top of a tower block in Euston, one of the most polluted parts of London. And yet what it is seeking to do is to increase biodiversity and to combat air pollution uh, by investing in landscape. This section of the exhibition is about community, because how a landscape is used is the ultimate test of any project. And we've got a really interesting collection of projects here. Um, some of them are very small scale and led by the community. Some of them, like All the Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool, is very large scale and shows an incredibly interesting investment in using the landscape, in creating new parks and creating new sustainable drainage schemes. What we have here is an approach to landscape that says communities need to be engaged in the project. They need to affect how the project is evolved. And if they're not happy with the way a project is designed, then the chances are it won't work, it won't be liked, and it won't be loved. Alderhay is a particularly interesting scheme. It's a children's hospital. It's built in a park. It's also, in a way, um, a Teletubbies landscape, because what it does is to use uh, landscape, trees, grass on the, on the walls and on the roof of the hospital and to create new amenity. All of the children who use the hospital have a view of the landscape from their hospital bed. So it's a way of engaging the community in a health resource, but also in a playful way. We also have a project called Incredible Edible Todmorden. This is a project which was uh, created in Todmorden, in the Pennines, in the north of England. And it's a project which was led not by landscape architects, but by community activists who wanted to change the way in which their town was designed and to change the way in which their town was used. What they started off by doing is guerrilla gardening. They found places, the, um, the brambles outside the police station, uh, the rather derelict air area outside uh, one of the health centers, dug it up and started planting. And the only rule was that anything that was grown on these community spaces should be available to be eaten by anyone who lived in the area. And Incredible Edible Todmerton has now turned into a national project called Incredible Edible. And what you have here in Alderhay and in Todmorden is two very different examples of an interest in the relationship between landscape and community. And if you don't get the relationship between those two right, then you're unlikely to have a successful project. Water is a very significant part of this exhibition. Only a year ago, the headlines were dominated by flooding and an incredible panic about how we should deal with it. Our view is one of the sensible ways of dealing with water with managing it is not to run away from it, but to find sustainable solutions. Sustainable urban drainage is one approach to making sure that when water lands on the ground, it disappears into the ground and is not unnecessarily piped to the other side of the city. We've got in the exhibition a group of excellent examples showing how sustainable drainage works in action. We've got very large scale projects like the Olympics, but we've also got very small but very significant projects like Derbyshire Park, which is a pocket park outside the community centre in Bethnal Green. And what Derbyshire Park shows in a space occupied by just 12 car parking spaces, that if you create sustainable drainage schemes, if you invest in rain gardens, you will have the opportunity to create really, really useful amenities. In this case, it's created a brand new park for the local community. It's right next door to a community centre. There's a rain garden, there's sustainable drainage schemes, but also there are bike storage sheds with living roofs. What we see here is an example of sustainable drainage in action, and it's a really, really important example of the way in which our approaches to flooding, the way we manage water, can be really intelligently designed and managed by the landscape architecture profession. We've called the next part of the exhibition Saving Lives. Now, 
it may seem quite surprising that we're talking about saving lives in the context of landscape, yet pollution, certainly in parts of London, has never ever been higher. It's a very serious issue and the way in which landscape can affect pollution is very significant. Several of the case studies we've got in the exhibition look at the power of good landscape, particularly city trees and city parks, to combat air pollution. Public health is a very important issue. Uh, the change in legislation uh, just a couple of years ago means that public health directors who used to work for the National Health Service are now working directly within local authorities and essentially sitting alongside planning departments. Public health directors have an opportunity to be involved in the way in which our cities are designed and planned and they have a powerful role in looking at the way in which investment in landscape can help us improve the quality of our lives. This might mean combating pollution, it might also mean just looking at the way uh, you walk to work, it might mean the route that you take with your children to school. Is it polluted? Is it a green route? Is it a very unfriendly route? So there's a very important relationship between public health and landscape and we've got a number of really interesting examples of that in the exhibition. The next section in the exhibition is on money. Um, investment in landscape has a huge impact on the regeneration of the city. One of the projects, the Central Park in Valencia, was described by the Mayor of Valencia as the single most important economic project in Europe. This may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but what it talks about is the way in which investment in landscape then triggers investment in housing, in jobs, in health projects. We've got a whole host of projects which make this point. Another, which is really interesting, is called Swansea at Tidal Bay. This is a project which is devoted to the creation of um, energy through tides. It's also a project which will create a new landscape, a new marina and a new tourist attraction. And it's a splendid example of the ways in which a multifunctional landscape can serve lots of different needs. It may be about putting a place on the map, it may be about creating a new tourist destination, and in this case, it's also about creating electricity. It's a good example of if you think very carefully about combining the different elements of landscape architecture, you can create a sustainable project which makes a huge impact. We have one section in the exhibition which is rather mysteriously called Orchestrate, but the title has been deliberately chosen to talk about the way in which a conductor of an orchestra brings together potentially conflicting and dissonant elements into one perfect symphony. And what we've tried to illustrate here is the power of landscape architecture to bring things together. And one of the most successful examples of things being elegantly and eloquently brought together is the Olympic Park. In many ways, the Olympic Park changed the face of landscape architecture when it was open to the public in 2012. Many people were amazed by the flower meadows, by the way in which the River Lee had been completely rerouted, or they were just amazed by the fact that it was a delightful place to spend an afternoon and view the Olympics. Since the Olympics uh, completed, the park has been transformed and it's steadily moving from being a showcase for an international sports festival to a community park for the East End of London. But with all of that, there has been this astonishing coordination, this orchestration and this attempt to create something which is truly splendid. In many ways, the Olympic Park is not only at the heart, but also the inspiration for this particular exhibition. The walls behind all of the individual projects are based on the flower meadows that became such a signature of the Olympic Park. And it's really testament to the power of the Olympic Park that we are now talking about landscape, I think, in a way that we didn't a couple of years ago. Beauty. It's a word that sometimes causes embarrassment and often it's not a word that is used when evaluating landscape. And yet, what often makes a huge difference to our lives, either in our own back gardens or in our choice of where to spend our holidays, is whether or not a place is beautiful. So what we wanted to do in this exhibition was to talk about places which we think are beautiful. And we've chosen a number of projects which just explain, explore and illustrate beauty in the landscape. One of the most sensational schemes um, is called Gardens by the Bay, and it's a very large-scale scheme in Singapore. A much, much smaller scheme, and which came out of the London Festival of Architecture, is Bankside um, Urban Forest, which brought horticulture, 
and allotments uh, to the area just near Tate Modern, south, south of the river. And we wanted to stimulate a debate about what is beautiful and what isn't beautiful. This section of the exhibition also includes the garden bridge designed by Thomas Heatherwick, and you've therefore got a really fascinating showcase. Um, walk across the bridge or go into the massive conservatories of the gardens by the bay in Singapore. From Beijing to Battersea Park, the potential of landscape to change people's lives is phenomenal. We've got examples in the exhibition of huge landscape schemes which are addressing pollution, creating new lakes, creating new amenities. We also have the brilliant example of the redevelopment of Battersea Power Station where a fabulous but very derelict building is now being recycled with green roofs, green walls and a completely new landscape. What we've also got in this section is the redevelopment of a number of 1960s estates. Many estates in London and the ones we've chosen include the Aylesbury estate in Woolworth and the Woodbury Down estate in East London are undergoing a massive transformation. What's fascinating about that transformation is that buildings which used to ignore the landscape are being demolished and being replaced by buildings which sit comfortably in the landscape. For example, Woodbury Down Estate overlooks two reservoirs and a nature reserve. For half a century, the buildings have ignored them. The new development is absolutely addressing the nature reserve and turning that landscape into an amenity for all the residents in this part of London. From a pocket park in Bethnal Green to one of the largest projects in Beijing, this exhibition illustrates the depth and the breadth of landscape architecture. It illustrates some of the most far-reaching attempts to change the way we live in the city by rethinking the urban landscape. We have 45 projects which I think are a source of fascination and inspiration to all. All of them are available to view at the exhibition, but they're also available to view on the Building Centre website as a permanent testimony to some of the creativity that's gone into rethinking the landscape.